Hello and welcome to episode number 24 of 11FS Spotlight. I'm Melissa Stringer. In this weekly show, we shine a spotlight on the best and the brightest in tech and financial services to try and understand what gets them growing, growing and what they think the future of the industry will look like. A big part of the show is your involvement and your questions, so please leave them in the comments sidebar and we can answer them live for you today. On today's Spotlight, I am delighted to be joined by Charles Dellingpole, CEO of Comply Advantage. There he is. <laughs> How are you doing today, Charles? Um, it's great to be here with you, Melissa. Hopefully we'll get the um, video as well, though. No? Yes, hopefully. Um, great. Always, always a few tech problems. But anyway, regardless, how are you doing, Charles? Where are you calling in from anyway? Um, unlike you, I'm down south by Platform 1 or Victoria Station in London, very oh. far from Kentish Town. So, yeah. Okay. Well, nice. I hope the weather is suitably delightful and sunny down there. Exactly, yes. It's, um, it's like the Miami of central London and Victoria. Exactly. That's amazing. I'll come on my uh, holidays when lockdown is finally over. Absolutely. Righty. So on today's show, we're going to be talking all about um, financial crime landscape um, specific to 2021. Uh, so let's get started, shall we? Um, I think the first thing that would be really great, Charles, if you could uh, just tell us a little bit about how you came to be the CEO of Comply Advantage and uh, a little bit about you. Um, fantastic. Yeah. So um, I started the company. This is my third company that I started. I guess the second one was a fintech company when fintech wasn't fintech and it wasn't sexy. It was just invoice finance or at least a division of that. Um, and so, yeah, um, in, 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 in building that company, I realized that the problem I really hated was the risk of going to jail. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I think I think the reason why it's interesting is for many fintech companies and a huge part of your audience will be passionate about fintech is that their biggest cost base their biggest problem and one that they don't actually realize is in existence is the risk of financial crime as in as soon as they try to start a company then suddenly they have all these issues around oh you're 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 you're, you're, you're laundering money for cartels or you're financing human trafficking or you know all, all, all these kind of very inconvenient risks so um and in, in kind of going through that experience myself and um, being a nominated money laundering reporting officer inadvertently, um, I thought the way that it was done was very, very poor and there was huge upside. So really the, the purpose of the, the company was to try and eliminate financial crime, but then ultimately all risks as well around finance. Yeah, I think that's really, really laudable, and you're absolutely right. I think when uh, when when people decide to start up um, start up companies and they build a team and they get some customers, particularly in financial services, there are all of these uh, peripheral risks that actually become really integral to the success or or not of the the business. And um, yeah, as you say, I think the compliance side of things can sometimes seemingly not be as sexy as other parts of uh, growing a company, but um, it's sort of one of those really essential hygiene factors to to get right. And if you, you don't, then it can all kind of uh, go really badly, really badly wrong. Um, so I did hear also that uh, you started the company from your garage. Is that is that right? Um, yeah, I think um, I started the company on this desk um, oh. back in 2014. Um, and then um, the the developers were lucky enough to be in my garage. So we had, I think, seven of them um, in, my, in my garage downstairs. Um, and then we had people talking to clients in my living room. Um, yeah, so um, they were lucky enough to have the, the, the whole space to themselves. But unfortunately, some of them had lots of um disgusting pizza and so yeah um that's why eventually we moved out into proper offices um and now we're closer to 300 people wow that's so amazing yeah fantastic congratulations as well and that i mean that does sound very rock and roll so the kind of antithesis of the sensible company that i kind of have in mind with comply advantage i imagine that you guys are 
uh, always perfect at everything and uh, always have every process completely nailed down. Um, but yeah, pizza boxes is giving me a more of a romantic impression of the genesis of your business. I mean, I, I think the intention was um, to inculcate a culture of like parsimony or at least kind of being reasonably conservative with money and not being like, no, like I think deliberately we had offices which weren't like um, sparkly or or, 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 or or like deliberately impressive because we want it to be about fundamentally building the best product yeah. for our clients and not about like, you know, I, 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 I think often the, the message that kind of amazing offices give is that you've succeeded or you're kind of out of the woods and somehow like it, it's all about the physical um, dimensions of what you achieve. So yeah, I, I, I think I think deliberately we want people who are scrappy and um, were about building things and believed in the mission and the vision yeah. and um, weren't immediately dissuaded by working in a garage. And I think the people that we've had, um, so, some people are still here today, six years on, and those have been really the core of the business. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah, getting behind the, the vision and uh, yeah, working because you believe in the, the truth of what you're trying to bring to the market as well is really, really important. I totally, totally get your point as well around the physicality of uh, success. I think you get that in the legal profession, for example, a lot. Very shiny, beautifully well-dressed, polished people. Yeah, <laughs> I've got one of my best friends works in the, the legal profession and she's got some amazing outfits, 100 suits, I think, something like that. Yeah. Anyway, um, so let's focus on financial crime. And um, I guess the first thing will be interesting um, fr from your perspective is how you would actually describe it, because um, it's quite a, a, br a big sort of topic. So how would you define and describe financial crime what's happening in 2021 yeah I, th I think there are numerous kind of terms people use like financial crime or regulation mm. Often those things those kind of once you interrogate those particular concepts the different subcomponents have nothing in common and they're actually utterly divergent so i think specifically the area that we're interested in is money laundering and terrorist financing so money laundering is the opposite of tariffs financing in that terrorist financing is making good money bad whereas whereas money laundering is making bad money good so mm -hmm. they're kind of two sides of the same coin i think um the kind of other dimension of financial crime is fraud and what you see in the past 12 months is roughly like 10 20 percent of gdp globally being transferred from state balance sheets to household balance sheets mm -hmm. and fintechs have been the conduits of those funds and naturally um, as those funds are being moved, scammers have tried to intercept a huge amount of those funds. So, um, but then also, I guess people are being very conscious of geopolitics, and um, particularly with the migration from um, Trump to Biden, and from the UK being no longer part of the EU, you've seen you've seen how geopolitics and therefore sanctions are interesting. So, um, I think although we've only got forty minutes, we could talk for hours about different subcomponents of financial crime regulation. Um, and ultimately, those are all things that we touch on. Yes, absolutely. Um, so you mentioned um, as well around, I guess, the um, criminal cr criminal behaviour kind of evolving. And do you think that um, COVID-19 has exacerbated that? And in what way do you think that that is more, uh, pertains more to 2021 than perhaps in 2020 and before then? Great question. So in terms of the evolution of criminal behaviour, I think there are two different points to that. I think firstly, there's baseline anomaly detection. Um, and secondly, there's the kind of migration to remote working. Um, in terms of anomaly detection, a, a key tool that people use to detect fraud is deviation from the norm. And obviously, what we saw a year ago this week was people's behavior changing. So um, it was very difficult to detect what was normal and therefore what was aberration and therefore potentially a fraud. So I think that's been a huge challenge. Um, and then secondly, in terms of people working from home, I think only an hour ago, I had a Slack message from one of my team who was invited to a monthly review from me, but it wasn't from me, it was from a scammer. Oh, so, oh, okay. I think like we have this constant barrage of like CEO fraud or people trying to intercept invoices and payments. Um, and that's just us. And we're a reasonably small company. Um, so. I think I think um, 
if that's a problem for us, then you can see how when you've got armies of people who are not at home, um, who, 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 who aren't able to talk to each other, I, I, I think you can see huge amounts of money being um, stolen by scammers in this new work from home environment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, I guess a lot of um, small businesses and individuals have had quite a lot of support for various reasons as well from the government and from uh, from their employers as well. Have you have you seen any issues um, related to that specifically? Are there any things that people ought to watch out for? Um, so I think it kind of varies a lot um, by jurisdiction. So. I think a big challenge in the United States, so we have a big team in New York, uh, it's one of our biggest markets, is you have the problem around synthetic identity fraud. And within US payment systems, ACH fraud um, is very different in, say, Singapore, where we operate as well. Um, so really, it kind of varies by the tactics that scammers have adopted. Um, you can see in the UK, certain postcodes are known for scamming. So um, really, um, it varies by geography, jurisdiction, by the tactics that criminals have adopted. Um, but I think um, SMBs are at the receiving end because they haven't got the money to be able to invest in financial crime tools, in experienced teams. And I think really, this is a scale game. So I think part of the, the mission statement behind Goodbye Vantage was having, been, having run a fintech, it was to give the tools that would have been only available to large companies, to small companies, such that they can fight back. So we have a thousand plus clients um, all over the world. And really the vision of the company was to democratize access to these tools such that anyone can use them rather than only an HSBC or a Barclays can use them. Yeah, I think that's really amazing, actually, um, democratizing that access and protection for smaller businesses, because I suppose if something goes wrong for them, perhaps it's, you know, financially, relatively speaking, more of a catastrophe than um, for, for a bigger company as well. So I think that's a really amazing mission. Um, we have a question, actually, from uh, Alexander Haynes, who said, uh, what about when deviation becomes the norm? And I think he's relating relating that to um, behaviour of, uh, of criminals. Um, that's a great question, um, Alex. Yeah, I think I think in terms of um, that baseline norm, I think I think now people um, have have data on what norm is and mm -hmm. therefore that is the new normal. Um, so therefore, we can detect how things deviate against that. I think um, I, I think a year in, we know what um, fraud looks like. We know what kind of risks there are, and we have data on that. I think I think um, I think um, the real challenge. I, I think you're seeing kind of fraud rates which are forty times higher in neo banks, fintechs versus say community banks because those people haven't been authenticated face to face. They haven't been known to the institution. So. I think the challenge there is without data and without an opening up like hundreds of accounts um, to trade, to invest, um, often the data is scattered amongst institutions. So um, that's the real challenge. Yeah. Oh, that's really interesting as well. And um, I guess a question, uh, a question around geographies then, do you think there are um, some areas of the world where this is more prevalent, the idea of identity fraud. Um, I'm just thinking about some of the client engagements that we work with around the world and there's sort of varying atti attitudes and degrees to which they uh, that they encounter this problem on a daily basis. I mean w one of the key challenges we face is so we have a database of like um, 11 million high-risk entities, people who are involved in terrorism, money laundering, people to look to sanctions and I think um, we, have, so we have clients Japan, Korea, I think challenge in Korea is that everyone is um, like you have very common surnames like Kim um, or, or, or in India or, um, 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 I, I, I think the real challenge is to disambiguate those entities and determine actually was that same person accused of human trafficking or what or, or were they sanctioned so one of the things we try and do is collect as much data about their ownership of other companies about shell companies about relatives known associates so um it really is an arms race in terms of detecting identity and disambiguating entities oh that's yeah that is super interesting as well and just to go off on a slight uh tangent there um 
because I, I worked in FX for quite a long time and we used to have to um, do really deep compliance or uh, like KYC on our customers. And so you get the uh, the organizational structure and then you get the directors. And then if uh, it includes an international company that owns part of it and then their directors, it's, it gets very, very complicated. Um, so aside from obviously using a tool like um, Comply Advantage, are there any... Um, are there any approaches or uh, is there anything in mind um, that, that, uh, that compliance officers in, in companies should, uh, should implement? Is there any like strategy um, for, for success in being able to root out uh, dangerous payments or dangerous uh, elements within an org structure, for example? Yeah, so um, one of the things we have is a database of every company in the world and every linkage ownership. Um, so you can tell subsidiaries, sanctioned entities, um, associates and minorities, as in if they have chunks of shareholding, um, if say one Topco is sanctioned and a subsidiary um, isn't listed, but is still controlled by that Topco. Um, so um, a big a big part of what we've tried, so we, we've now raised circa $100 million and a lot of that's kind of gone into engineering um and um i think um a key part of it is it is i mean every company now says they have ai right um you know it's like teenage sex in terms of everyone says they're, <laughs> they're kind of doing it right but not many are but i think what the next kind of frontier i think is i think and more technology we're exploring is around semantic reasoning and looking at the kind of graphs and so, so once you index every person in the company world you can then look at um you, you then know um, what the what the what the kind of average is, and therefore you can do a anomaly detection, and you can reason with the graph, right? So, um, and because we've got both data on the terrorist money launderers and those eleven million criminals, we then superimpose that into the corporates shareholders, mm -hmm. and so we're kind of constantly expanding that risk information graph of like all seven billion people um, who they own, facts about them, um, and that makes possible all kinds of technology. So, so I think the original kind of goal of the company was to solve the problems of financial crime, but also ultimately risk, and that's credit risk, um, fraud, AML risk, right? And that's only possible if you have full control of all data. Um, yes. and so that's kind of, that's what we're putting the money to be used for. Yeah, that's absolutely amazing, the scale of that. Um, and you're absolutely right about credit risk as well, and um, you know everything to do with lending, even from a, an individual uh, point of view so so also um i'm wondering about things like um you know open banking and open finance and uh different countries that are on various you know on, on the scale of openness and uh conservatism on that topic um how is that impacting the work that you do and the data that you might have access to um so i think there's different like you know oh, under the UK open banking regime, you have AISP, PISP, right? So you have account based service providers, payment initiation service providers. Um, so I think um, so I think payment information is for us very interesting. So we have um, transaction monitoring and payment screening um, functionality, right? So um, the former is you look at every single payment the company's made and all the entities, and you can say, okay, there's anomalies with regards to the money going to Iraq or Syria or people are trying to circumvent payment patterns by sending payments for sub to thousand pounds. So, and then the payment screening element is looking at transactional narratives. So for instance, if I send you a payment for KHAT, which is a Somali cocaine substitute, that would be illegal in the US, maybe legal in the UK, right? So it's kind of taking a policy in the legislation and then enforcing that in terms of tra the transactional flow. And I think mm -hmm. part of what we're trying to do is by having both transaction monitoring, payment screening, and the underlying data is to unify that, right? So um, it's only by having full stack graph um, entity data combined with transactional flow that you can then find um, the real issues underlying those flows and reason about them. So I think um, the reason why I started the company was because intractable problems, which had bedeviled institutions for many years, resulting in huge fines and massive operational teams, and I guess part of the thesis was you need to be full stack end to end um, with the technology. And that's why we've got like 200 people in software, right? Um, mm -hmm. So, um, and therefore to your question around AISP data aggregation from open banking, if that can flow in, then that's good because that's more data to help, you know, if you have SARS, right? To, to your point around, 
if it's purely informational purposes, um, you need to have as broad a uh, reach, as much data as possible mm -hmm. to understand precisely where the risk lies. Yeah. Um, but the th but the thing is also, um, and I, I say this from kind of a, a personal pain point of view as well. I mean, some of the organisations that um, I've worked with on a consulting basis and uh, also directly in, in the past, particularly in the early 2000s, would have the equivalent of uh, SARS. And for everyone listening, that's, uh, I think it's suspicious activity reports. But you can have like so many of them in a day. Um, particularly if you're um, processing a huge number of, uh, of payments or if somebody uh, is transacting a currency that's not within their like expected parameters or you know slightly over what you've estimated when you're signing up your customer or, or whatever. So there's a lot of noise. And I'm imagining still that a lot of organizations just don't have the manpower to be able to go through all of this right so just to, you know to your point charles if you if you don't have uh you know a modern uh infrastructure from from front to back how do you actually deal with that because a large proportion of it particularly in conservative traditional banking is very manual um yeah I, I think it's a great question so i i think for me the thesis was um it has to be technology and it has to be you have to create a company big enough to be able to invest in this and share the infrastructure yeah. so um and i think the reason why we had massive fines and banks being shut down people going to jail but also having huge operational overhead was because of poor technology so um like if you look at the amount of technology coming out of google amazon facebook what's possible now i think the entire thesis was we want to be able to make it super easy to deploy super easy to integrate mm -hmm. Um, and just constantly improve, iterate that functionality. Um, and I think the future cannot be more more compliance officers on 100 grand plus. It has to be automation, efficiency, because lots of fintechs, lots of 11FS clients that you've kind of created or, or assisted are going to be scaling hugely. And you need to have some improvement in margins as you scale. Otherwise, what's the point? Yes, totally. Um, I mean, that, that sounds like a, a no brainer. I think, um, yeah, if you could have an automated technology approach to it rather than it being manual, as you say, and having all of that uh, risk and responsibility on one person, precisely as you say, with a very expensive compliance officer who are brilliant, but um, I mean, they can't possibly look at every single ticket if there are thousands of them in, in a single day. Um, and when, when you're um, talking about, you know, um, sensational data leaks do you mean the uh, fincen um the leaked files um because that was sort of a, a catalyst for a few regulators um to update their processes hey yeah i think if you look at the the work that OCCRP have done and wikileaks i, I think after like a, a key catalyst for the fifth money laundering directive as well as crypto and the Bataclan terror attacks was the Panama Papers and public outrage at um, the Icelandic prime minister owning offshore assets. And I think I think just the real shock at the amount of illicit financial crime and assets being hidden in the Caribbean. So I think similarly with the... Oh, we lost Charles for a second there. I'm hoping that he, uh, I'm hoping he comes back. Are you there, Charles? Hello? Yes, got you, got you. Yeah. We lost you for a second, um, mid-flow. I caught most of what you said, but... Um... Yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, so um, leaks generate public outrage, which generate regulation, um, yeah. which is good. Yeah. Um, so I think, I think the more we can do to um, pressurise politicians to crack down on poor behaviour, and the more we can do to improve the underlying technology. So, so I think part of the thesis is regulation is where it is because of where technology and um, public policy is, right? And I think um, two factors. Over time, people become less tolerant of bad behavior and evil, right? Like um, Jeffrey Epstein, Butterfly Trust, um, human trafficking. Um, like, I'm not sure if you've seen the documentaries on that, but like, that was shocking, right? Um, yeah, absolutely monstrous. Yeah, you're, you're right. It really is like completely horrendous. Um, 
and and yeah i mean this is a, a massive topic um and yeah so i i can i can see that it's much bigger than i had actually really thought about and i'm sure most other people don't realize quite how how huge this is and how important the interrogation of this data is and constant monitoring as well and um you know, like I said back in the, the day, you maybe have like a daily check or something or a weekly check, but the constant monitoring is actually the thing that protects us all and keeps everybody safe. Yeah, I, and I think, um, so the global AML regulator is the Financial Action Task Force and that informs national regulators. And I think they've been holding sessions this year on how can technology be used to solve financial crime. And I think they're still in this investigative stage. Um, like the argument I made, at the session like last week was um, a key a key a key challenge is um, most companies are only screening say seven thousand names from the U.S. Treasury or or or, 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 or the U.K. Treasury. Um, in fact, they should be screening all eleven million names that we have in terms of adverse media. I I think because it's possible and because um, technology is improved, companies therefore should also raise the threshold of their work they do as well so i think the key thing is if people are known in the press for being scammers or there's um them being in jail for previous um harm they've done to society then that should also be looked at when institutions make their choices so i think regulation should now rise to match what is technologically possible as well yes totally agree um we have got some questions um from the audience which is uh, which is great please keep uh, sending your your questions in and we'll uh, ask charles to answer them so the first one is uh from nirav what are a few trends you can see in the crypto world in terms of financial crime and aml sanctions um so we've got some super exciting press releases coming out soon with regards to some great crypto clients that we're working with which I can't disclose yet, but if you want exclusive, I'll do that. Um, but yeah, crypto is super exciting. Um, um, I've done quite a lot of work recently on um, non-fungible tokens, mm -hmm. and that's a super exciting trend. I think um, you saw the Beeple artwork sold for $7 million by Sotheby's. Yes. Um, that's like the evolution of smart contracts made real. And it's great that, for instance, um, if you were an artist, then you'd be able to issue... Um, art and get paid a percentage not on issuance but on resale too right so i think i think lots of skepticism but i think that represents a fundamental a fundamental maturation of the underlying capabilities um of crypto and mm -hmm. yeah I, I think um it's actually really cool for, for artists and and creators i think it's cool too definitely yeah there's lots of uh, noise about um about that the tokenization of uh, tickets and albums and yeah the creative uh, creative potential is is massive really exciting so next question and i'm really aware of uh, time um but i'll try and squeeze in as many as possible so the next question is and i'm sorry if i pronounce your name wrong but i think it's uh zolkaranan zolkanan uh, how much can digital signature help us to keep away from email frauds? Are they really helpful in the fintech industry? Um, I think two days ago I signed a DocuSign. I, I, I spent an hour and a half on DocuSign mm -hmm. signing a 400 page document with hundreds of signatures. Um, I'm just very glad that I didn't have to do that physically, right? I think, um, but yeah, I think. Um, I think the broader point is digital identity. I think you've seen um, some of our partners like Socure, Jumio, um, um, raise hundreds of millions in the past week. And that's a testament to the underlying innovation going on. I think, I think you've seen, like, if the past 10 years has been about moving the bank branch into the mobile phone, probably the next 10 years will be about moving um the real world into um a kind of virtual parallel world right um and you've, you've seen the beginnings of that but i think i think really um this year and working from home is really just the beginning yeah that's a um that's a really good segue so uh so building on that what do you think the financial crime landscape holistically will look like in 2022 and what areas do you think still need developing 
Um, so I think I think um, one way I've heard it put is that you've seen the past ten years, like people have been looking for like since since the Twin Towers attacks, since 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 the advent of BSA, you, you've seen you've seen people looking for the, you know a tool to help them find the needle in the haystack, whereas actually what they want is an electromagnet just to drag the single needle out. So I think I think fundamentally at some point there's going to be a radical shift in the way that AML has done. Um, and as we all know, like technology tends to like the, the future's already here. It's just unevenly distributed. And the best way to um, predict the future is to create it, right? And I think what we tried to do is build something like like I I, I, I think at least in terms of what we're trying to do is build something radically different. And I think hopefully um, you'll see that coming out this year from by Vantage. So I think hopefully we can shape the future and solve the underlying problem of terrorism, money laundering, and criminal financing. I mean, that just sounds amazing, doesn't it? If you can, if you can help to solve all of that, um, really exciting company and amazing trajectory. And I'm certainly more, way more excited about financial crime uh, prevention uh, since talking to you. So this has been really helpful for me too. Um, do you think, Charles, that there's anything else that you want to say or that we haven't discussed? Um, I appreciate that we could probably talk about this all day, and I'm finding it fascinating. Actually, I'm learning a lot. I think I think like in terms of 11FS and the audience, I think um, people often wonder like, are we late in fintech and mm -hmm. can there be as much innovation or, or, or capital? I, I think I think we're still super early on in terms of fintech, and I think there's still going to be tons of innovation. Um, so I think yeah, I think the next five years should be um, far more exciting than the past five years, and we're just getting started. Yeah, we totally agree. One percent finished always. 99% left to go. Amazing. Yeah. Great. So um, I think we're coming to the end of the, uh, the show. Thank you, Charles, so much for joining uh, me and telling everybody about your amazing business um, and the fantastic work that you guys do. Um, where can people find out more about you guys um, and everything that you're getting up to? Um, so we're across Snapchat and um, Tumblr and um, TikTok. So yeah, yeah. I think um, we also have a channel. We also have an internet website um, and a Twitter feed as well. So please, please hook us up on there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so Hannah will also post some of the links in the in the chat below as well. We can um, definitely share some stuff on uh, on social media as well. Brilliant. Right, so that's all we've got time for this week. Um, make sure you follow 11FS on LinkedIn so you never miss an episode. And Spotlight will be back uh, next Thursday. Have a great week, everybody. And thank you so much, Charles. You've been amazing. Bye. Pleasure.